Welcome back to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW. And of course, with me is the one, the only, the man with the plan, BQ. Say what's up to the people. Hey, what up, folks? Uh, I put a tweet out this past week, which, granted, Twitter doesn't always have the best reach in the world. Impact Wrestling should probably take that into consideration. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Twitter doesn't have the best reach in the world, but I did put the information out there into the Twitter sphere that uh, the charging port of my laptop broke. And uh, I'm taking it for repairs today, but I couldn't take it over the weekend. So we actually couldn't record uh, a standard Cool Factor episode over the weekend, which it was no surrender weekend. So that usually provides problems for us anyway to review the show and to make it relevant with the pay-per-view or monthly special coming so quickly. Uh, but right now we're trying something different. I've got my phone, mic's plugged into the phone, all that good stuff. So, you know, hopefully this comes out well, but we at least wanted to uh, talk about No Surrender with you guys. And uh, thanks for rolling with the punches. Yeah, sound sounds good. Sounds come, it's coming through quality. So uh, I think we're in a good spot. You, you got your mic that you have right there. That mic is plugged into your phone right now? It is. I have an adapter. Nice. Look at you. Yeah. Technology for the win. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, all right, so we're gonna get into a, a little bit of a no surrender review because obviously no surrender happened, and this was after the episode of impact and everything like that. No point in going back to that last week's episode of impact. So we're gonna get into a little no surrender review and maybe talk a little bit about where we see it going next. But BQ, is there anything you know, anything outside of the ring, uh, outside of the impact zone that you kind of wanted to get into before we get started? putting me on the spot there i know i'm usually supposed to be prepared with this information but there there's nothing that i have currently that i you know care to speak on that you know if something pops up by the next time we review the episode of impact we'll get into it then but nothing nothing uh tickling my fancy today all right so i kind of caused a little stir in the uh impact lounge uh engagement group this week when i uh i posted that you know do not miss this week's episode of the cool factor. Cause I, I said, I had some numbers that, uh, that would be interesting. And so, you know, I know a lot of people are really interested in, 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 uh, in, in, in what, what I'm going to say here. And listen, I I'm not, I'm not an insider. Okay. I don't, um, I'm just, I'm just casual observer. I'm a fan just like everybody else, but I do work in the television business. Okay. I work in the television business. I work for a big company. Um, and so I, I understand the corporate world. Okay. Um, I understand like, um, producing media in a digital space. And, um, and so I understand that there's some things there, right. There's some things there that appear to be lacking, uh, for the impact wrestling product. And it's funny because, you know, most of us, we, we, when we talk about like, you know, either podcasting or, or following Impact Wrestling or talking about in, in Impact Wrestling in like this internet space, you know, a lot of us come from the same place with it, which is that, you know, we felt like the coverage of Impact was often very negatively biased. And we just wanted to kind of be part of a community or a positive voice for people who want to actually just enjoy the product and talk about the things that we like about it. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, enjoy these extra things, right. To help you be more excited for the next time you're going to watch the show, not feel more negative about a show. You just watched that said, if we said it once, we said it a thousand times, this ain't, the this ain't the fanboy show. Okay. This ain't the, we're going to tell you that everything is good and great show. Like, no, we're going to, we're adults. We're adults. We look at, um, you know, it's, it, I'm somebody who watched wrestling from like from time I was like a little kid in like the 80s and 90s, you know, all the way up through like I took a nice little break in like the early 2000s when I went to college. And then, you know, I got right back into it probably 2005, 2006 ish. And so I missed a good chunk of when people kind of transitioned into everything's on the Internet. We're all about like the dirt sheets and reports. Like I missed a lot of that. So a lot of everyone's like constant obsession with the business side of pro wrestling. I always took that as like annoying because I was like, why aren't we just watching and enjoying the show? But here's the thing too. As grownups, right? We look at things and we do wonder about like the monetary aspect of, it. we wonder like, you know, is this business thriving? 
And if so, like, how are they doing it? And what is it about this business that people are eating up and buying up? I think we, it's, a, it's a natural curiosity, again, especially as adults, as people who pay bills, right? As people who um, try to make as much money as we possibly can to, you know, for our own lives, right? We, we, are, we are curious about the business of things, okay? Like, so there's nothing wrong with wondering and inquiring about how companies function if they're being successful or looking at why maybe they're not so successful. So, and trust me, I'm bringing this all together. I'm bringing this all together. In the case of Impact Wrestling, right? Like, um, I'm someone who's been banging the drum for, man, I want to see them, you know, play bigger venues. I want to see them expand. And especially with AEW coming along in the last three years and going straight to, you know, the 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 bigger venues, the five, seven, 10,000 seat uh, arenas, playing those consistently, it made us people who have been sitting around watching Impact for all these years go, man, why can't they just get back to that, right? Um, and for a lot of us, the answer we lean on is that they have such a bad, damaged, you know, reputation due to the negativity that floats around the Impact slash TNA name out in these internet streets. Swig of coffee for the working man. Mm. So we know that that's the thing. But is that the biggest thing? Is that the only thing? In my opinion, I think that is a very huge thing, right? Like, for example, I think there's like a lot of people that pay attention to Impact Wrestling, but will not talk about it or tweet about it or in a public space because they feel like embarrassed. It's like um, it's like if you watch some sort of like sneaky porn category that you're like, I don't, don't want to tell people that I like that. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the way a lot of people feel about like liking Impact. Um, I hopped in a few Twitter spaces after Saturday was a really fun day for a wrestling fan, right? WWE had a pay-per-view at like noon. Um, then Impact had a pay-per-view at eight, right? So that's like a fun day of like consuming and talking about wrestling uh, for us fans. And um, I jumped in a few different Twitter spaces and people were talking about like one, one comment that kind of caught me, like people were saying, oh, you know, oh, some people say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to the Impact show tonight. And then somebody be like, ain't nobody watching that, blah, 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 blah. You want to be one of the 500 people who watch the Impact show? <laughs> and it's like, that's the thing, right? It's like, you people want to shame you for being one of a few people who like something, right? So it's like, people equate not a lot of people liking something or not a lot of people supporting something to something being bad or something being wrong with you for liking or supporting that thing, right? Like internet logic, it's like weird internet troll math. But to me, it's weird. Like, you know what I mean? Like, okay, Cause I, I just, I have never, for whatever reason, the way that my, my wiring is done, right? Like I just don't really care what other people think about what I like and what I wanna do. You know what I mean? Like I'm just, if it ain't putting no money in my pocket, you know what I mean? If, if it's not beneficial to me, like other people's opinions have never felt beneficial to me. So um, it's just not how I operate. Like, I don't really, I don't really care. Right. So just this whole idea that people don't want to talk about impact. People don't want to watch impact because they don't see a lot of people talking about it. It's, weird. it's so weird to me. Like, I don't really get it. So <clears throat> that begs the question, why don't more people watch impact? Is it just because of the negative perception, which I think is, is, is a thing, but also what can be done about that? right? What can be done about that? Well, some would say nothing, right? Because I've said for a long time, I think that TNA is the most damaged brand name in the history of entertainment. Like, I think it's like impossible to resuscitate or rehabilitate just for all of the negative will that the name TNA has, 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 has accumulated over time. But I just don't know. Like, it's a, it, you know, BQ pointed out a, a while ago when we were talking about something that, you know, like the, the glory days of TNA, right? Like the apex of TNA was, in my opinion, 2013. That's almost 10 years ago. So there's a whole generation of wrestling fans who really have no experience with all of that, right? There's, there's, just, there's just been like this idea of impact slash TNA as being a thing that people don't like. But people don't really know because they weren't really, you know, in the mix having these conversations. So why is that relevant? That's relevant because you got to understand that there is an audience out here that can see Impact Wrestling as a fresh product. 
Dave Meltzer is never going to see Impact Wrestling as a fresh product because he's had his opinion of it fixed since 2002 or whatever, right? Like he's never he's never going to see it, it as like a fresh product. But there are plenty of people out here who really don't have a truly formed opinion of Impact other than this is what other people say about it. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because Impact has an opportunity to change the perception about its product if they properly market to the audience that is out here consuming wrestling every day in these internet streets, okay? And we have talked about this like many times, how, um, you know, Impact needs to, you know, one, clearly define who they are, what their brand is, what their mission is, right? Who's their target target audience, right? Like Impact needs to clearly define that stuff. It's like for Impact's been around for 20 years, but it's almost been like 20 years of just existing. Like when Impact first popped up, it appeared that the, the, the role they were trying to step into is, hey, we're the new WCW. We're the WCW alternative. We're going to give you all the guys, you know, who you like seeing in WCW who don't want to go over to WWE right now or maybe aren't wanted in WWE right now, but we're going to give you all those guys. So I guess that was fine for a while, although they, again, they never still, they never clearly defined themselves like that, but everybody knew, right? Like Vince Russo was in it. uh, um, uh, Ed Ferrara was, was in it, you know, it was clearly Jeff Jarrett, right? Like all these guys who were in WCW at the end really had a big hand in the beginning of TNA. So again, the assumption that this is this is what's risen out of the ashes of WCW, that was right, what, what, what was right there. But then like over time, right? Like with if you don't clearly define yourself, other people are going to define you for you. And so people decided they wanted to define uh, TNA as WWE light and the place where, uh, where, where any WWE star who couldn't hack it will just go and get a payday, right? The, the company that's ran by a, a, a money mark, Dixie Carter, right? Like an impact did next to nothing to ever truly define itself, right? Which is why we're having this conversation today. You could do a whole podcast on what the hell is the X division if you wanted to. Okay. But they still, but, 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 but impact still views that as like a pillar of what this company is. You know what I mean? But they, but they can't clearly define it. Right. So anyway, we're not going to, we're not going to go in on that, but so what I did, right. I had wanted to do this for, for a while. And so what I did was I reached out to someone who is a, um, a a social media manager um, for, large corporate brands okay and i asked him i said hey you know if you get a chance can you take a look at something for me as i want to know you know impact wrestling right like what do you think they would need to do in order to you know kind of change their 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 perception the way they're viewed by fans out here in these internet spaces and so he did a quick search, right? Like not even like, I, like I, I, did, I didn't, you know, he, he did this work for me kind of pro bono, but just looking at some things as someone who is in the business of doing digital marketing on a corporate level. And the quick takeaways that, the, the quick takeaways that he, that he came away and told me was that, first of all, it's not just social media. They need a whole digital marketing division. And that was like, Right, like mind blown, like understand because it is, I have said, you know, plenty of times, oh, they need a social media manager. It's not just a social media manager. It's who's managing, again, like not just your social media accounts, but who's deciding where your ads go, right? Who's deciding, um, 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 you know, who you target, who's collecting that data. I was in a conversation um, Saturday with some people and we were talking about WWE and I was talking to someone who worked in an administrative capacity at WWE and she mentioned that the detail in which WWE has its fans categorized, WWE could pick you out by name. They could pick you out by name and they have a, they have a file on you, what you like, what wrestlers you like, 
what you will buy, what you won't, what you won't buy, what wrestlers you support, what shows you like, like this is how clearly defined they have their fan base, right? So for example, right, like if if WWE knows you like Drew McIntyre and Alexa Bliss, when something new comes out that involves Drew McIntyre and Alexa Bliss, you're going to get that email. You know what I mean? You're going to get that email. You're going to see those tweets pop up in your in your feed. You're going to see those ads pop up in your Facebook feed because they have it clearly defined who their audience is, who their audience is that like specific things they do, right? So this is not just like, <clears throat> hey, watch Monday Night Raw this week. It's, hey, these these characters of ours that we know you really like are going to be at the Bob's 15 miles from you. You need to pop up over there and, and get an autograph. You, you see how, how detailed that is, right? That's not just, let's post some tweets. That's not just somebody who used to work here did a big thing in WWE this week. Let's post an old match they did, right? Like that's, 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 that's not that. And BQ has mentioned so many times how annoying it is that impacts social media strategy seems to be wait till somebody who used to work here makes news in WWE or AEW and let's post an old match. Yeah. Guess what they did on Facebook a couple of days ago. And I'm going to let you get right back. You're saying Do so. they, they posted Cody Rhodes versus Mike Bennett and Brandy Rhodes versus Santana Garrett. Shocker. Shock. Right. And why do you think that is BQ? Cause they're in the news. And, and I've said this before, too. That is a social media strategy. It, it is. They're, this isn't something they're pulling out of their ass. But for this company, it does. that is not the, not the same singular strategy works for everybody. This does not work for them. It, it pops the people who already watch the show and will no matter what. And that's the wrong person to try to, to please. Now, some of the people who watch our podcast fall in that category. So I'm not saying you're, you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're a bad kind of fan, but you are not the kind of fan that they have to constantly be trying to win over. Right. And that's what a lot, that's what the strategy is doing. The people who are popping in the comments, like, Oh, you know, that think it's funny when they, they post something that's going on in WWE and Oh, check out this Bobby Roode match. The people who are popping in the comments, it's fine that you're that type of fan. It's the wrong type of fan to, to reach out to though. Because right. that, that fan is going to watch. It doesn't matter what what you got going on. That's your most loyal fan. You have mm -hmm. to appease those people. You have to please them. But it can't be the driving force to, you know, what you do on social media. Then, you know. So please continue. But I, I want to throw that out there that I was willing to bet money, dude, that we were going to see like a Brandy Rhodes match on there. Yes, you did. A, <laughs> so. Yeah, it, exactly. And so, again, um, so, so so for someone – that um again so i outsourced information just a little bit of maybe not not even an audit just like a surface look i was like hey just take a look at, at, at impact wrestling and tell me you know what it is you think they need in order to significantly you know grow their brand improve their product and the first thing that he popped up was like yo basically they need a digital division like not a social media manager again a digital division because it's not one person like i just i, I just i guess gave you an example of the detailed data, the detailed customer data that WWE has about its fans and potential fans. Okay. And I, I used to work, um, I used to work for the New York Jets. I worked in sales for the New York Jets when they were building a new stadium. And even in that database, we had access to fan groups who used to be season ticket holders. We had access to fans who bought sports tickets in the New York, New Jersey area. We had access to fans who bought NFL jerseys. We had access to, fan, you know what I'm saying? Like this is, it requires a, a large scale marketing, like casting a wide net is knowing and having this information and using it, right? Like even if you're cold calling people, just know that you are reaching out to people who might possibly fit a fan description, right? Um, so it's that, right? Having like the detailed, the, the detailed access and knowledge about who potential customers are. Um, and here's a, a, a big thing, right? And I'm, I'm gonna read you this directly to, directly from, from, from my DMs, right? I'm not gonna expose because I keep all my, 
I keep my 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 my, my sources private. Okay. Um, and plus, any listen, just in general, I'm a big like loyalty person, right? Like I believe if if, if you and I have a conversation, it's confidential unless otherwise. And I did tell. Uh, my buddy who I reached out to, I said, look, this is for an impact podcast. And I just, I'm curious about the way they handle their, um, their, their public perception problem. Right. And so anyway, um, you know, he mentioned, not only do they need to have a division, but the division needs alignment. He says their previous attempts have been segments approaches that of different overreaching goals. They need a real digital division with a strategies that align back to the organization's goals. Right now, there's nothing and it doesn't kick back to any goals. Now, that's not from an Impact fan. That's not from me, TW, who watches every week and says, Impact, who are you? Where's our guys? Right? That's not, that's, that's not from me, the jaded fan or the aggravated fan. This is from an outside impartial observer, observer who is looking at uh, not a wrestling product, but a company and how they present themselves in the digital space. Like BQ just mentioned, the biggest thing they do is they put out segments online, right? They, the, the, the Cody Rhodes segment, the Brandy Rhodes segment, right? But what are your goals, right? Again, what are your goals? I could tell you, I could rattle off WWE catchphrases right now. They, they call themselves the greatest value in live entertainment. And when they call themselves that, what do they do? They show you commercials of fans jumping, cheering, enjoying themselves so that it pops in your head. Oh, I have a, uh, I have an eight-year-old child. Maybe they would enjoy the lights and explosions and, and stuff that happens at a WWE show, right? Like they, you have to clearly define who your fan base is, right? Again, AEW, <clears throat> I don't know that AEW has said this, but I think we can all picture what we imagine the AEW target fan is. You know what I mean? Like they, <laughs> they define who they, who they are going after and they're clear and they make no apologies about it. Okay. And again, with impact, who are you? Not only do you need to define yourself, but in defining yourself, you're going to help yourself because that's going to give you a target audience to go after. And the things you do need to align back to your goals. And then my friend, who's the social media manager, he sent me some information about the way the impact is currently advertising. And this was a, from a few days ago. So some of these ads are no longer active, but there's, there's links publicly, public information about the, the ads that impact is running right now. So when you find access to this information, you can see what impact is doing, what they're advertising right now. The only ad that impact had been running was tickets for No Surrender and for the show the night after. That was it. That was it. If your only goal is buy tickets to our live shows, bro, like that ain't it. That ain't it. You got to tell people, you can't just say, hey, I got some wrestling tickets. Like, does that sound like a, an appealing thing that you want to give your money to? Like right. you got to, you, you, you got, people get paid to do this. Okay. People get paid to tell you why you need to give the go in your pocket, give them your money for an experience that you are going to value. This is what I'm saying is that impact does not tell you why you need to go in your pocket, give them money for an experience that you will value. They were running one ad and now they're running a different ad. You want to guess what that ad is for? Since sacrifice, and I'm sorry, since since no surrender already passed, it's for the next live event, which is I think March 5th in Louisville, Kentucky. That's the only ad they're running on on um, on Facebook and Instagram. If you search, if you were to go up into that search bar and then type WWE ads, you get an endless amount of stuff because not only because everybody and anybody who posts anything related to wrestling tags it with WWE, but also because WWE, they advertise not just, hey, WrestleMania is coming up, but they, I guarantee you, if you were to search, you would see they were running ads for who the winners were at Elimination Chamber. That was two days ago. Okay. So they're, they're running ads for who won. So you need to know what happened. You need to know if your favorite won or if they didn't win. Okay. You need to, you need to know what's coming up next. What's coming up next? WrestleMania. That's six weeks away. Right. So they're advertising WrestleMania, but I bet you they're also advertising Monday Night Raw. I bet you they're also advertising if people who have specific 
uh, demonstrated fan bases are doing something. Like, for example, let's say that, let's just say, for example, that Impact is getting a real bump in ROH fans who want to see what's going to happen next with Honor No More. Would it make sense for Impact to be heavily advertising that there was a major swerve in, uh, 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 involving Honor No More at the previous show? Wouldn't it make sense for Impact to be letting people know that these Honor No More folks are staying around now? If, if <clears throat> let's just say, let's just say that the Bullet Club was a really popular thing around the world. Wouldn't it make sense for Impact to be advertising that a major thing happened with the Bullet Club this past week and you need to tune in to this Thursday? Because you can run, you can run ads on Facebook for two days if you want. You know what I mean? You can run ads for three days. So between now and let's just say Friday, right? You should be running an ad for this upcoming episode of Impact. And not just for this upcoming episode, but maybe even if you just got like a fire video package about Moose, your world champion, right? Like these are all things you could be doing. You should have information on who's Moose's target demo. You should have like impact, they, they would send out surveys like about what stuff you like, what stuff you didn't like. And you use that data and you find out, okay, this demographic typically clicks that they like Moose. This demographic typically clicks that they, they thought Moose had the best match of the night. You organize all that data and then you make sure those people get some information on the wrestler they like, right? You make sure those people get some, get some Moose t-shirts in their email, okay? Right, like, again, so... The, the, the amount of ads that they're running and for the type of things that they're running, right, suggest that either there's no effort being made, which I don't believe. I think there is an effort being made. I think that there's an effort being made, but they don't have people in place who are high level professionals at this type of work. And it's, it's ridiculous because the amount of money that stands to be made, if you imp if you create some buzz around your product, people like wrestling. Wrestling's been around forever. Like, uh, oh my God, wasn't there a GCW show that did like, you know, thousands of people at the Hammerstein Ballroom a couple of weeks ago? You know, mm -hmm. like all these local wrestling promotions are doing big numbers all around. Why? Because they have buzz. People like wrestling, right? You just got to find these people. You got to, again, but again, GCW, right? Like they have a target audience. They know what they're selling. They know who their fan is and their fan knows what they, they, they can expect the vibe of a GCW show to be. Impact needs to define itself and not, not just for us, but you also need to define it for you. So you know who to sell to and how to sell your product. And it's not going to be for everybody, okay? Right? Like, AEW fans love AEW, but it's not for everybody. WWE fans love WWE, but it's not for everybody. Impact seems to be comfortable just being there, right? Like, we're a wrestling company, and we've been here all these years. We're celebrating Impact 20, but that's 20 years of kind of just existing. Like, yes, you put on some great matches and some great moments, but... How about if you want to make 20 more, if you want to get to impact 40 or maybe even impact 30, okay, how about you define who you are? So fans, let the fans decide, okay? Let the fans decide what direction you could take. Tell the fans, this is what our product is. Like there was one point where I thought impact was close to doing it. I don't know if you remember this BQ, but there was a time when they had Kurt Angle and they had a, a campaign going called Wrestling Matters. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I like this because they were basically saying that we're going to be the company that gives you dope wrestling. And I'm like, yo, you know what? Boom. Let's do that. There's a time when, uh, when ROH was, uh, their tagline was the best wrestling in the world. Okay. Like, again, you got to define what your product is. And, and so people know, right? Like what to expect from you. And then you can figure out how to attack your fans. So listen, like I said, a lot of this information is all, you know, out there for public consumption. If you guys have any inclination towards marketing, um, look up some marketing tools 
and you get, and look up how to search different things from different companies and you can find all that information right there. So, um, you know, this is not like earth shattering stuff, but it's just evidence that impact needs to do a lot better. Again, the, the digital marketing strategy is more than tweets. It's more than posting segments. It's defining who your audience is, understanding how to attack your audience. And that's how you grow your fan base. Okay. Like not just your viewership, not just your clicks, grow your fan base. So I think, you know, again, um, I don't know if that, if that's what some people were expecting in terms of, you know, when I said I had numbers, but the numbers matter, those numbers are significant. So BQ, you know, I, uh, pontificated for a while there. You tell me what your takeaway is from, from all the information I just gave you. So the first thing I want to say is that I, I picked this up, especially watching No Surrender, but I've picked it up in the past. You know what impact style of wrestling is that no other company really has? Is What's that? It is the most logical, sensical wrestling that you're, you're going to watch. And so, so what do I mean by that? What was that main event on AEW this past week? Uh, Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara. And I've mentioned this about Jungle Boy. These guys are in the same breath. You have to shoot them in the chest. You have to light them on. I know, I know Cody actually was lit on fire. You have to light them on fire with a flamethrower. You have to hit them <laughs> with a grenade, uh, you know, be a grenade launcher to beat them. It's in, it, uh, I saw Chris Jericho kick out of LAX's finisher, LAX, Santana and Ortiz's finisher earlier in the show. Impact doesn't do that. At No Surrender, there was at one time where someone kicked out of something that was just like, oh, come on, dude, that that has to beat you. That should beat you. It was very logical. It made sense. The, you know, every, everything did. And Impact is like that. They have, uh, you know, the wrestlers really practice an old school style. Like the stuff that Jim Cornette is like, hey, this stuff is gone from professional wrestling. Impact does it. He doesn't know that. You know what I mean? I mean, he's flat out said he won't watch that show, but he doesn't oh, know God. that. That is a style of wrestling that I think people are hungry for, mm -hmm. but they, they don't even know that that's like the Impact brand, you know, that they're putting out a, a very logical sense with, you know, we like to talk about, you know, us fans like to use the insider term to talk about psychology. Like Impact has psychology, dude. I mean, uh, Sammy Guevara missed a 450 splash or whatever onto the uh, – you know, no, it was it? He didn't miss that, but there was something. Oh, uh, Darby Allen took a cutter on the outside, mm -hmm. and fifteen fifteen seconds later, he was up. Right. You know, uh, and then uh, Sammy missed the four fifty splash onto the ring apron, or the hardest part of the ring, right, Excalibur. Right. Um, <laughs> but he still managed to win the match a couple seconds later. You know, like we don't get that nonsense and impact at all. But that's a style of, you know, how do you how do you let the wrestling world know that's what we do? I, I don't know. Um, but that's what the fo focus should, should be, you know? Right, right. Uh, but again, it's not your job to know, okay? But there are people whose job it is to know. And it's the job of the company to hire those people, right? That's the thing, right? It's not our job as wrestling fans to say, this is how you market to us. It's not our job as car consumers to say, this is how you market to us. It's not our job as fast food consumers to say, this is how you market to us. But they find a way to get it stuck in our damn head that two all beef patty, special sauce and lettuce cheese, and pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That's how you make a Big Mac. Okay, I know that because they market it to me in a song. Okay, <laughs> you know, like, right. I mean, again, like, you know, it, it's, it's, this is this is Impact's job, man. And it's, and it's the reason for, um, you know, fans like me, and I'm sure like a lot of you who look at Impact and like, man, this product is good. I want to see the product grow. But the product being good is not necessarily the reason that it grows or doesn't grow, right? You got to sell it. You got to get somebody out there to sell it. And again, it's not like like back in the day, Don West used to go crazy screaming and yelling and, you know, and, and, and selling stuff till he was blue in the face. Um, and that's one way to do it. Right. Another way to do it is, again, you keep pointing to WWE because they're obviously the best at doing this. 
look at the way they market anything, right? It's just it's just beating you over the head with with terminology and with with dates and with names and images over and over and over again. You know what I mean? Until you just know off the top of your head that WWE Network is nine ninety nine. Right, like they just they just beat you over the head with the terminology um, until you know that they're calling uh, uh, WrestleMania the ultimate thrill ride. Right, like again, just beat you over the head over and over and over and over with the terminology until you know this is the first ever women's hell in a cell. Again, man, like it's just there's a method, there's a method to do it, and it doesn't just come from nowhere. Right, like this is um, the the big reason why Vince McMahon, I think has uh saved the wrestling business the wrestling industry right is because he's out of all the people who have run a wrestling company he's the best combination of like you know of like marketer and of like um uh like uh what do you what do you, what do you call somebody like a like a pt barnum type you know what i mean like somebody who sells just attractions you know what i mean like so he understands like you know, big. And he understands that it's all about the customer live experience, right? Again, like this thing that I keep talking about, about if people look at impact shows and see people there having fun, it's going to make them want to go to impact shows. Vince understands that, right? So he makes sure that the music is loud and interesting. He makes sure that there's light shows that you see that make it more, more engaging and entertaining. He makes sure that there's, you know, big video trons to absorb all the content. He makes sure that you're, you are absorbed in the story. So when something happens, when a big moment happens in the ring, you've gotten all the story as to why it's a big moment. Vince McMahon understands that. He's not the only person that's capable of understanding that. You know what I mean? Like, that's why you put big companies together so that they can, you know, look at strategies that work, okay? And again, not just basically copying a strategy, right? But 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 the method for reaching that strategy, right? So, um, so again, I'm not saying anything that's rocket science here. And everything that I just said here, Impact should already know. But, the good thing about talking about these things like this is so that you, the fan, me, the fan, we all can know, um, we all can know like what type of effort they're putting in. So while we're sitting here, you know, hoping and wishing that a bigger crowd shows up for the next impact show and that a crowd is more excited and lively for the next impact show, we got to understand there's a reason. There's a reason why people show up in the numbers they do or don't, right? You got to spend money to make money. Okay, if you want people to come in, like there's a direct correlation. Look at like politics, right? In politics, the politicians who spend the most usually win. Because yeah. people believe what you show them, right? So again, you have to show people why your product is worth consuming. And I, I do have experience with Facebook ads. I haven't run one in probably three or four years. Uh, but I, I had uh, probably between 2014, 2016, uh, ran quite a few. Um, and they're dirt cheap. Twit now, Twitter and Instagram ads are expensive. They're almost not even worth the click, to be honest. Facebook ads uh, and Google ads as well, very, very cheap. And when you, when you have a, a proper Facebook marketing campaign, social media, you, you have, okay, let's say, we're trying to sell tickets to No Surrender. You don't just put out one ad saying, hey, No Surrender is coming to your town. Now, if you're a small independent company, yeah. But in an ideal world, you have three, four, five different sets of ads that are saying the same thing. Um, one, it may be an image. You're using an image. One is you're using a video. One is you're using an actual website to click on. And... And then you track the data, what's working. And whatever is working, you put the majority of your money on. You don't get rid of the others completely, but you put the majority of your money in that area. And and each ad should also, um, let's say you're doing an image ad. You target fans of Ring of Honor, WWE, Impact Wrestling, and one. The, you know, you, the next one, you target fans of Diana Perrazzo, the Bullet Club, and something else. Use different keywords as well. 
there should be, and I said three, four, five, there should be, when you're running an ad, there should be dozens of the same thing, but speaking to different people. And then you find what works. You can't just run one ad and be like, okay, that's going to get the people there. That's it, It's not going to work. You know, you have to be creative. And that's what having true professionals in that space, instead of someone who's just learning, you know, it's their, uh, um, what their side gig. I'm trying to think. We have this in the military. It, it's like uh, someone has their apprentice. Their role with, no, no, but they, they have their like role within the organization. Oh, they, well, we call it an additional duty. That's what it okay. is. Right. You yes. Know? Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. And I and I believe I heard people say this, like you know, uh, the Josh Matthewses, the D Lows, like they wear a ton of hats at Impact Wrestling. And again, like that's fine, man. But like you know. Again, if you want to play, you got to play, right? If you want to play, if you want to be a player in the game and it's there again, like dog, GCW dog, you know, like you can't tell me that GCW has the same infrastructure that Anthem has. Okay. Like Anthem bought access TV from a group that includes Mark Cuban. Okay. Like this is not like, this is not peanuts. This is not a company that has no money. doesn't have infrastructure. But you got to hire people who know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? You got to hire people who know what they're talking about, who can push their brand, who can push Impact's brand and get it out in front of more wrestling fans. Because again, ultimately, like, we're not complaining for the sake of complaining. This is something that's going to help you. This is something that's going to help you get more people excited about your product. So, And, and you know, one thing they're not, you, you mentioned what they were running ads on because, you know, people in that space can pull up that information. Um. The YouTube stuff, the YouTube insider. So uh, let me let me transition here to NWA real quick. I was watching NWA the, the other day, and they have a package on Fight now because you know they have a paywall. You got to pay to watch N- NWA. Now they're kind of like, okay, we need to scale back on that a little bit. So they're just like, instead of paying Fight TV monthly, if you pay a one-time fee or a yearly fee, which is discounts you like a hundred bucks throughout the year. Not only are you going to get the episodes, you're going to get the four pay-per-views. Nice. Uh, so basically, for less than you pay right now to just watch the show. And now they're going to start transitioning the show to YouTube, but uh, like, like a week or two later, some, something along those lines. But I'm watching NWA, and they're they're promoting this. during you know They have their own little commercials they do between segments, and they're like, Fight TV, get da, 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 and it lists everything that you get. Mm-hmm. We've never seen anything like that on Impact Television. Yeah. We're not like, you know, they'll be like, hey, no surrenders coming up. At what point in the show, we're like, this is how you get to watch, this is how you can watch No Surrender. And this is the value you get for five bucks a month. I don't even know what I pay for that. Yeah. Th- that doesn't happen at all. There's no, you just m- mentioned the page, there's no Facebook ad saying, hey, this is how you watch Impact. They're relying on us in the Twitter world to tell people how to watch the show. Because yep. people are still to this day, how, how do I see it? How do I watch? Yep. If I don't have access, how, you know, it's not out there. You talked about nine ninety nine, dude. They po- they that was the marketing campaign nine ninety nine. They didn't even tell you what the hell nine ninety nine got you for the longest time, dude. And Jr. J- was always real critical of that, and and there, he wasn't wrong, but they drilled that into your head and then you're okay. What's the WWE network about, mm-hmm. you know, impact plus the YouTube insider, like it's foreign. If you, if you're not on Twitter and, and just see, see their tweets, even on their own YouTube channel, they haven't run a commercial that says, you know, YouTube insider, this is what you get, at least not to my knowledge. Maybe there's something out there. Um, but as much as they like to re upload the Bobby Roode matches and re upload the AJ Styles matches, if there was a commercial out there like that, you re-upload it every couple months, right? Or, or once a month, and say this is what you, you know. Um, when Jeff Jarrett was around for that brief period of time, there was always a little ad at the beginning or at the end that was like, "Hey, the Global Wrestling Network." Boom, you know. Yep. It, it's foreign to people, dude. You're, you're on your show saying, "Hey, no surrenders coming up," but but no one is telling us. You don't even have to run a commercial. You, you don't even have you know Tom Hamilton saying, "Hey." You know, the YouTube insider, you pay this and this, and this is what you get. This is how you can watch those. That doesn't exist. Right. And that's because it's not that they don't want it to exist, but that's just, that is what happens when people wear additional hats. 
mm-hmm. and people have additional duties, their mind is not there in that exactly. space. Exactly. And and I said that I, I said you know look like I don't I don't think it's for a lack of effort, but I think it's it's not really necessarily fair. Like you said, man, dude. Like you know if you're asking Josh Matthews to produce a whole show that has a ton of issues. Okay, like, and, and you know, to not miss every little thing, like, dog. <clears throat> listen, um, when when I produce TV shows, there's so many things you have to know, you have to check. Okay, like, there's scripts, there's talents, there's live hits, there's graphics, there's transitions, there's things that have to be pre-taped. Making sure those pre-tapes, make sure you have the things timed out properly, right? Like, there's a ton that goes into producing. Any TV show, TV show, digital show, anything like that. There's a lot that goes into it. So then to turn around and ask, you know, some of those same people, right? Again, if you got to do commentary, you got to do, you got to have research and background on the stories. You got to have research and background on the moves, on the wrestlers, like all that stuff. Right? just like, again, man, like let people be good at a thing. You know what I mean? Like let people be good at a thing instead of just kind of being there. Right. Like you're at, like you said, if you're asking Josh Matthews and D'Lo and, you know, Ross Foreman do all these millions and millions of things, like just let them do one or two things and be really good at those things. You know, like, like um, I, I understand that companies want to turn a profit, but again, like you gotta, are you spending your dollars efficiently? Okay. Like the, um, if, if you're, if you're, if you're being efficient, but you're just spinning your wheels in terms of growth, what good does that do anybody? You know, like what good does that do anybody? So impact, um, again, I think the idea that this company operates with is if we just keep putting on a good wrestling show, eventually word of mouth will spread and, 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 and we'll get over the hump. Maybe, maybe, but it's less than likely. And I'll tell you why it's less than likely because for every person you have saying, yo, impact's pretty good lately. There's three or four people saying, oh, don't nobody watch that. Impact is trash. Oh, how do you even get impact? You got to have a jailbroken fire stick with a, a, a wire clothes hanger and Apple TV in order to get impact. Like, I mean, there's there, there, there's so much uh, anti-impact sentiment that exists by people who don't even watch impact, but they shout down people who want to talk about impact. So again, this is why you market, you put it in their brain, you make them see it, you make them see it, you make them see it. You have to tell people that Deanna Perazzo is doing something amazing, right? You know, you, you got to tell people that. Like you mentioned about like running um, different ads for people who are fans of different people. Like again, like, bro, come on, man. Like nobody should have to tell you that you need to be marketing what Deanna Perazzo is doing right now. You know, nobody should have to tell you that um, uh, like they're creating some buzz with what's going on with Josh Alexander. Lots of questions, you know, is he, isn't he, will he, won't he, all of that. That's a, that's a, that's a topic of conversation right now. And it's cool to create little organic things like that to start conversation. But is that something that's going to keep people watching your product? Like you, again, we, uh, we talked off air and I mentioned Deanna Perrazzo, right? There's a lot of people who hate Deanna Perrazzo, right? Like, and so if you're running ads that have Deanna Perrazzo featured saying, uh, Deanna Perrazzo is going to be in New Orleans this weekend, you know what? If there's a thousand people who see that ad who all hate Deanna Perrazzo, anywhere from 10 to 100 are going to tune into the show just to see that person who they don't like, because that's just the law of averages. That's the way that works. So again, it's not, you don't just promote the one thing. You got to have like multiple strategies. You got to have multiple strategies for doing stuff and you got to, and you got to do it. You got to, you got to put that effort into doing something. Okay. So there's like, uh, you know, you don't just do things the one way. You got to spend the, you got to spend the time. You got to spend the money. You got to put the effort into creating the perception that you want for your product. Right. And, you know, uh, we, we're going to transition no, no Surrender here shortly, guys. Um, but when you run ads, when you run Facebook ads, and I say you use an image, Maybe one image is Deanna Perrazzo heavy. One is Bullet Club heavy. You have a Bullet Club heavy image that is directed to people who are fans of the Bullet Club in New Orleans. Like, you know, you can't just be like, hey, wrestling fans in New Orleans, this and this and this. Like, 
there are so many ways that you segment it and break it down uh, to make sure that the proper people that you want to be at your shows are seeing the ads, you know? So it's, it, 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 again, we don't feel it's for lack of trying or lack of want, but there's a lack of execution. A lack that's, of execution. And it's, and it's an unnecessary lack of execution. That's my biggest thing. It's an unnecessary lack of execution because there are people, professionals who are good at this, who are for hire, who can help you create a digital marketing division that will help uh, change your perception in the public space. Exactly. So we can get into this in the future. You guys want to hear more or whatever. Uh, but, you know, we'll get into no surrender here. We'll try to we'll try to knock it out quickly. You're running a little long. So, yeah. But that, that was interesting, uh, you know, and that, that was definitely like something I think was definitely worth talking about because, again, it leads to the question of, you know, why impact is where they are and how they get better, which is what we all want, right? So that was certainly a conversation worth having. Um, and please drop your comments below on what you guys think about that, about, you know, about their marketing. If you have if you have insight into that type of thing, like we're definitely open to these uh, to these discussions. I think it's it's good, fun stuff to talk about, and it's eye opening, right? It's eye opening, and it's something that can be changed. And so maybe if we, you know, maybe if we if we keep the pressure on, that's something Impact will get better at, and they'll create, you know, a quality digital marketing division to help um, to really help this product and help us be able to enjoy it with more fans. Okay, all right, so let's do this. Uh, the countdown of no surrender saw Trey Miguel against John Schuyler, uh, the reigning X division champion. Trey Miguel returned to action as he faced off against the poised newcomer, John Schuyler. Trey's momentum bro was brought to an abrupt halt with a spear from Schuyler. Following a tiger bomb, Schuyler locked in a Boston crab to continue wearing Trey down. Trey hit an enziguri to create separation and regain composure. Trey hit a missile drop kick and then soared over the top rope to the floor with a senton. Then he hit the Meteora to score the victory. Um, so Trey Miguel is dope. I love watching Trey Miguel. I got to tell you, man, I wince every time I see that, that Meteora. I just feel like, dude, you are destroying your knees by doing that move. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's cool. It looks like it doesn't hurt. Nobody else in Impact does it. So, yeah. you know, there's that. The move doesn't look like it hurts. Like I, I could kick out of it. I'm sure of it. So, um, the match was cool. We, we, it, it got, it got us an opportunity to get Trey Miguel back on TV because he was out. So, you know, yeah. uh, I would have liked. It, it, I, I, I kind of would have liked to see him in his honor no more storyline. But I mean, I guess you don't really want to involve champions in it. But um, yeah. speaking of champion on this, uh, well, he's not a current champion in any way, shape, or form. But uh, this upcoming cool factor, depending on what the Josh Alexander news is this week, I want to get into that uh, to kick off the show because a lot of people are thinking it's a work. Uh, I'm going to tell you why it's not a fucking work. It doesn't mean he won't be back, but this is not a work. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next episode. Yeah, we, we will. We will. That's, <laughs> that, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. We definitely can't wait to dive into that one. All right. So GM Miller interview team impact comprised of Eddie Edwards, Rich Swan, Chris Saban, Rhino and Steve Macklin ahead of their high stakes showdown against honor. No more tonight. Team impact is on the same page as they look to send honor. No more packing. All right. So we got to Dashwood with the influence uh, Madison rain, uh, oh, Madison Rain and Caleb with a K versus Havoc with Rosemary. Uh, nothing much to really talk about here. Um, Havoc won with a tombstone pile driver. Um, what do you think about this? Uh, just that it was, you know, the finish was logical. I would have preferred to see Tennille win because they're in a uh, program for the Knockouts Tag Team titles. But right. uh, the way that they did it, it there, there's, there's a little silliness, a little, you know, goofiness involved in the storyline. But, you know. It made sense. I just don't think it made sense of the people in the arena who had no idea that Caleb's phone rang uh, with a call from the influence. Mm. You know what I mean? So uh, not the Great influence, point. but the inspiration. So uh, right. I think if you were there, you're kind of like, okay. But, you know, other than right. that, it, it was fine. Both both teams needed a win. Both team, both wrestlers needed a win. Both wrestlers couldn't afford to lose. That's one of my <laughs> least favorite matches. <laughs> right. 
All right, so we got uh, the official star of No Surrender. We had Chris Bay versus Ace Austin versus Jake something versus Mike Bailey in an X Division Championship number one contenders match. Says the winner will earn a future X Division title opportunity against Trey Miguel. Jake suplex Bailey over the top rope to the floor. Jake soared through the air, crashing into everyone on the outside. Bay uses Jake as Jake's back as a launch pad as he drop kicks Bailey off the apron. Bailey is the next to fly, hitting a top rope moonsault to the floor. Bay spikes Jake with a poison runner for two. Bay hits a huge frog splash, but Austin breaks the pin. Bay connects with the art of finesse on Bailey. Jake catches Austin with a mid-air into the void to win the match and become the number one contender for the X division title. So Jake Austin, uh, Jake Austin, Jake something is your new number one contender for the X division title. What do we think about that? So first of all, his finisher is into the void. I like that Tom Hanfin knows the names when lose. And I don't mean like, uh, you know, the Japanese, you know, the hot sake with, you know, like Excalibur. That's not what I'm getting at. Right. But, the wrestlers, you know, I talk about this all the time. We don't know the names of the finishers. If the finishers are even cool to begin with, that's another story. But it's like they kept, you know, match striker deal with the black hole slam. Really? Is it the black hole slam? Abyss's move? You know what I mean? Tom Hampton comes on board and it's into the void, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, simple. Very simple. And there's a big, we, we, you know, we obviously talked about marketing here for a long time to kick off the show. Here's the difference between AEW and Impact. During the during the match, the crowd is chanting. That was something. That was something. That needs to be a, a, a t-shirt today. Mm. I, I bet if I get on there, it's not. Uh, and, and that's one of the things, you know, we talked about this is, I mean, a send hook and all that stuff from, from AEW. Like, they take when something organically happens on the show, how can we market that? How, how can we uh, monetize that? And how can we, you know, make it a thing? Uh, that that should be a thing. And in the in the back uh, backstage, Chris Saban did tell him that was something. So it seems like maybe they're going to go that route, but go all in. You know, make it make it clearly defined. That's going to uh, be a thing for him. So he gets the win, and he's back in the title picture. We were worried about his status for a really really long time, and then you know it came out the story about his father and some you know mental health. Uh, so I, I can see why they're like, hey, we got to pull back on you a little bit. But now he's good and he's a good place. And now we're, you know, getting back to where we thought he was going to go. So awesome. Yeah, something. That was something. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I like Jake something being the next. Um, the number one contender for the X Vision title. I'm not saying I think he should win it. I'm not saying I don't think he should win it. Um, but I think that he's one of the people who we identified uh, pff, uh, almost a year ago when, you know, Impact seemed to have a bit of a letting of talent. And it looked like, you know, they just had to make space for some new people. They had to create some new stars. And um, we identified Jake something as one of the people who should be featured. And it did, for a while, like you said, it looked like he wasn't getting that. And now it looks like he's kind of back on track to being um, – in a better spot being used better by the company. So I'm looking forward to what's to come with Jake something. All right. Eric Young delivers his one final message to Jay White ahead of their first time ever matchup tonight. Young calls himself the best all around professional. This business has ever seen best all around professional wrestler. This business has ever seen. Um, We had Jonah versus black Taurus. Jonah collided with black Taurus in this hoss fight. Jonah swats Taurus out of midair, sending him to the outside. Taurus dives, uh, drives Jonah into the steel ring post, then dives to the floor to take control. Jonah hits back-to-back press slams, one into the corner turnbuckle and one into the mat. Taurus begins to build momentum with a reverse sling blade, followed by a crucifix bomb for two. Taurus flies through uh with a top rope twisting senton for another near fall jonah hits a thunderous power bomb followed by a clothesline jonah finishes off to roost with the tsunami splash for three what'd you think of this match here i actually really enjoyed this it was a good host fight again i talked about logical wrestling and everything here was pretty logical you know the way that the match ended didn't make uh black Taurus look weak you know he, he got slammed off the top I think uh, he was hit with a power bomb or something or rather that he, he kicked out of. And, you know, and it took a little bit to get him down. 
you know, and he put up a fight. It wasn't like crazy Steve went out there, got his butt kicked. You know what I mean? So right. um, that's probably good that Habit got that win earlier in the night in that sense, because Decay doesn't beat anybody. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, but he didn't look weak in this. And uh, I, I want to know what, what happened with Dan Lambert and and, uh, and Jonah. You know, that <laughs> he showed up, watched his match, and we haven't heard a scene from him since. So right. I don't know what's going on with that. But, um, but again, just, just logical. And, uh, you know, it made sense. Everything made sense. And um, I like that. That could have been like a segue, Dan Lambert, you know, getting Jonah over to AEW, which is going to happen eventually. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that is going to happen. And uh, one thing I kind of noticed from this match is after Jonah won, I'm like, what's next for him, you know? And mm-hmm. this is where when you don't have a mid-card title, that's where there's a problem. The digital media is not a mid-card title. Uh, maybe it's going to get there uh, with Cardona, but right now it's a lower card title. That's what they've established it as. But that's the problem. You, when you don't have that mid card, like this is where like Jonah would be like, okay, I've, I'm ready for what's next. I'm ready for gold. But the gold isn't available to him. Right. There's nothing that he can challenge for uh, that, that would make sense on TV. You know, the, the natural progression is not, he's going to challenge Moose next, you know? Yeah. So uh, yeah, but, that's kind of what I was thinking as far as the title. And that EY promo was absolutely excellent, that video package. Really, really good. Yeah. All right. So Ace and Madman Fulton confront Jake something and X Division champion Trey Miguel in the back after Jake became the new number one contender for the X Division ch- champ- championship earlier tonight. Austin tells Jake that he got lucky tonight, leading to the challenge being laid out by Trey Miguel for a tag team match this Thursday on Impact. Um. So I like this. I like this uh, because they're not jumping right into the title match. Like, give us some time to build up, to anticipate. You know, maybe they'll do something where, you know, Ace and Fulton will get the win because of some miscommunication between Trey Miguel and Jake something. Like, just create some little tension. And let's drag this out for a while, man. Like, let's drag this out. Because I think there's a great chance Trey Miguel and Jake something can really put on a banger. But bangers are so much more fun when we care about the story. When we care mm-hmm. about the story, bangers are so much more fun. And I want to say this too, because so I don't want to forget this uh, by the time we get to the end of the card. Um, there was like, 11 matches on this show and listen if if that's the way you want to do it that's fine for like the impact plus shows but man let's keep the pay-per-views to five or six matches i'm telling you keep the pay-per-views to five or six memorable matches that people are going to be talking about um there's no disrespect to you know to the people who aren't doing that stuff that's that much more interesting but i think it actually creates more competition for everybody to be trying to be that much more interesting so that you have to put them on the card um and and even if stuff doesn't make the card it's still interesting for your weekly episodes of impact so i thought there was almost too many matches for this for this show because every match just can't be interesting you know what i mean um just Mm -hmm. keep it to the most interesting stuff but again if you want to create the um distinction where we're going to get a ton of matches to create value for these impact plus shows but then keep the pay-per-views pared down the big ones to five or six good you know balls to the wall matches then i hope that's the pattern going forward yeah all right So Eric Young versus Jay White, the leaders of Violent by Design and Bullet Club go one-on-one to determine who is superior once and for all. White gained control early in the early going with a high back body drop. Young turns the tide by whipping White shoulder first into the the middle turnbuckle. White hits a DDT followed by a twisting suplex for two. White talks trash in the corner, allowing Young to gain momentum with a DDT of his own. Young hits a high impact driver, a high impact driver. That's a thing. Okay. To remain in control. Young bites him on the forehead, then delivers a top rope elbow for two. Both men take turns raking each other's eyes, but white gains the upper hand with a pile driver on the apron. Young covers white with his feet on the ropes, but he's able to kick out. White hits the blade runner to score the victory. Uh, Jay White getting the win over Eric Young. What'd you think about this? So it was another match that I liked. I mean, I think I liked everything on here, to be honest. But, you know, I thought it was laid out well. You know, they did a good job with a heel versus heel match. And, 
we'll talk about the Bullet Club stuff later, but they did a really excellent job with how they um, laid the whole feud out uh, and the whole turn. I guess you could call it a double turn. They did a really good job with it. And this match here was able to throw us off the scent a little bit of something like that happening because there was kind of a separate right. uh, separate feud going on, so to speak. So, you know, yeah. excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent. Jay White is a hot property right now. And um, and he, yeah, he clearly is representative of or other organizations. But, you know, I, I think Impact, you know, can definitely utilize him to, you know, gain viewership um and potentially you know gain ticket sales that type of thing um you know the crowd told you they're very interested in him so you know give the people what they want mm -hmm. all right ace austin continues to pursue a friendship with mike bailey and ask him to be his partner against x division champion trey miguel and jake something this thursday on impact austin tells bailey that neither trey nor jake respect him prompting bailey to accept his offer so that's interesting right i thought ace austin would have had Madman Fulton as his partner. That's 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 pretty interesting. Yeah, but we've been so been there, done that with the two of them, and they don't that's beat true. anybody. So that's um, true. they're true. giving they're giving Mike Bailey a personality that is is different on the show. It's it's uh, it's just overly positive, somewhat naive, you know, naiveness. And this he screams the type of wrestler that in the past would have just come on to do good matches and they would have like creatively had no clue what the hell to do with them. Right. So, you know, they're finding something that works. He's uh, a pretty they're... damn amazing performer though. Like I gotta say, I'm, uh, when, when I see a wrestler perform for the first time, like I try to look at it, you know, objectively, you know, as like a blank canvas. Um, and usually I'm looking at like, okay, there's something you can build on there, but no, you see Mike Bailey perform first time, only time ever. You're like, yo, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Uh, um, that dude is the real deal so I, I totally uh, like the idea of him being used as much as possible um, and yeah you know more Mike Bailey let's do it all right so yeah. we have the uh, ROH women's champion and the AAA Reina Duranas champion Deanna Perrazzo versus Miranda Alizé uh, the champ champ challenge for the ROH women's title okay the lucha baddie Miranda Alizé answer Deanna Perrazzo's champ champ challenge and chooses to challenge for the ROH women's world title. Alizé dives under the middle rope, colliding with Perrazzo on the outside. Perrazzo shuts down Alizé's momentum with a big boot. Alizé plants her face first into the mat with a modified spike Rana. Alizé hits a series of forearms in the corner, followed by a running boot for two. Alizé locks in the Miranda rights, but Perrazzo fights out of it. Perrazzo avoids a shining wizard, then forces Alizé to submit with the Fujiwara armbar. Um, Deanna Perrazzo, man, lining him up and knocking him down. The champ champ challenge, I'm here for it. I had no idea who this uh, Miranda Alizé was, but I like the idea of, again, just letting Deanna Perrazzo be a feature. Just let her be a feature. Just line him up and knock him down and, um, you know, like making her a destination part of the show. And she doesn't have to necessarily, um, you don't have to smother the knockouts title in that. You know what I mean? Like she is building up her own brand. So yeah. when she has the knockouts title, it means something. When she challenges for the knockouts title, it means something. And I would argue you should do that with multiple wrestlers. Really build mm -hmm. up their brand so that when they challenge for a title or when they hold a title, it really means something. Yeah, totally agreed. Uh, and that's something AEW does a good job with. A Impact does a good job with the knockouts in, in that regard you know what i mean so um with, with dave penzer caller miranda alize <laughs> i was pretty disappointed he was back i saw on twitter that he was coming back um and i, I was pretty disappointed it he sounds okay except for the part where he'll be like Jug! like he'll be like coming to the ring you know that's all good and then when he says the first name of the wrestler, that's when it sounds like me as a a, a child pretending I'm a ring announcer, <laughs> you know? And then he might do something, but it's that first, oh, that's what I, I it annoys me. Anyway, and Brian Myers even pointed out later, I can't believe he got through that without messing up. So, I mean, it, it's obvious to them. So, whatever, man. Um, so, so this was a cool match. I think people were expecting... Everyone talked themselves into Athena, Ember Moon showing up. 
Um, this made sense because he's a Ring of Honor competitor. So he's trying to get the Ring of Honor title. Uh, you know, clearly they're going to do an open challenge at Rebellion. And I, I, I would say I think it's going to be Taya Valkyrie because right now the, they're, I don't think she's going to return to the company. But the reason I say that is because people right now, the girls are challenging for the Ring of Honor title. They're, they're not even like pointing at that AAA belt. Yeah. So what that tells me is that at Rebellion, it's going to be for the AAA title, and it's going to be someone who wants that AAA title, mm. the Reina de Reina, so what someone who it means a lot to them. Um, and right now they have to keep that title in the United States, I believe. Mm-hmm. So uh, Taya, I really think it'll be Taya. Um, but until then, these open challenges are going to be, you know, these type of gals. They're not going to be let's not talk ourselves into oh well you know freaking right. Sasha Banks you know because that, that's where people are going with it you know they're taking it too high yeah. uh, that's not what it's going to be right now you know we'll get the payoff later. So but, I uh, love the idea of Taya uh, challenging for the Reina de Reina's championship and taking it you know back to AAA. Do you think it would be better to um, have her answer the open challenge like as a surprise at Rebellion or? Do you think you get more juice out of having her, you know, like having like a video pop up and have her, you know, say, I'll be accepting the Reign of the Reign is, you know, open challenge at Rebellion and getting a few weeks to promote it, you know, showing some Ty Valkyrie highlights. And like, even if you don't actually see Ty Valkyrie, like maybe do something where every time Deanna Perazzo comes out, you know, there's like a video message from Ty, like, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm, you know what I mean? Like something like that. Um, and then, you know, just, just building anticipation that way. That's a, that's, I think it should be done. I think we should know ahead of time who it's going to be. If it's Ty, if it's whoever, I think we should know ahead of time because open challenges are fun, but they they don't necessarily do a great job of promoting a pay-per-view. It promotes, you know, for us who are going to order, we're excited. But if you're not going, if you're on the borderline, am I going to order? I don't really watch impact. That does nothing for you, you know? Because exactly. shit, Impact has a history of open challenges being accepted by someone on the roster. Yes. You know, and, and I talked about a couple of years ago where I was getting depressed watching this show, the, the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, where I almost wanted to shut the Impact Lounge down. It, they had one Impact Plus show. I don't even know what the hell they call them now. Um, and that's branding. That's branding right there. Like WWE has their, what do they call it? The... Uh, what do they call the pay-per-views now? Uh, oh, uh, now they're premium live events. Right. And I don't even think that's a WWE thing. I think it's a Peacock thing. Um, or, or I think it, I think that terminology is out there. They're just adopting it. Mm-hmm. But like right now, we don't know. Are they monthly specials? Are they YouTube uh, premium shows? Are they uh, are insider shows? Uh, are they Impact Plus shows? Tom Henderson called it Impact Plus show. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what are they? That's That's branding. That's marketing. You know what I'm saying? But um huh. i got i you, got you, off wait 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 you think impact has some issues with branding and marketing <laughs> crazy <laughs> all right so, <laughs> uh, i'm not gonna lie i kind of forgot where i was going with that because I, I oh uh, uh taya we're, we're looking we're looking forward to seeing taya and her puppies i mean puppy back on the uh oh. impact show oh, oh no what i was saying is um <laughs> I, I think i was just hammering that home like promote it in a way not to the people who are Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, I was saying, you know, during the pandemic era, they had one Impact Plus show that was like, they had three surprise partners or opponents on the on the card, mm-hmm. and all three of them were the, from the fucking roster, you know? And I was just That's like, hilarious. <laughs> you, you know, I was just like, dude. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so if you're going to promote a pay-per-view, we should know who it is ahead of time. Right. So. Totally agree. Totally agree with that. All right, uh, Gia Miller interviewed Chapel Hart, who sang the national anthem earlier tonight at No Surrender. Knockouts world champion Mickey James tells Chelsea Green that after she defeats Tasha Steeles tonight, she's going to give Green the next opportunity at her title. Um, Real quick, uh, I saw this interview, and did you see Chapel Hart singing the national anthem at No Surrender? Did you see that? So, so I didn't see it because I fast-forwarded through it by accident. What happened was I watched the next day, and I watched mm-hmm. the two YouTube, the free YouTube shows on a separate file. But I'm sure they-, they showed it as part of yes, the broadcast. I'm pretty sure because okay. someone told me she did. Um, okay. I'm just saying I fast forwarded because I watched the YouTube 
show matches on a different file. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to No Surrender and realized I was on there too, I, I had fast forwarded. Okay. So uh, yeah, Lewis told me they they sang. He wasn't typically uh, impressed with it, but um, oh, okay. Oh, oh yeah. is Lewis a singer? Uh, the, the next episode of Shooting Up North, Lewis Carlin will sing the Star Spangled Banner. I'm looking forward to it, Lewis. Uh, it's time for you to deliver, okay? You just insulted Chapel Heart, good, close, personal friends of Mickey James, and now you must show that you can do better, okay? Um, yeah. I'm ready, Lewis, okay? The gauntlet <laughs> is laid down. All right. Uh, so we had Digital Media Championship, Matt Cardona versus Jordan Grace. Um, after Matt Cardona won the digital media title in controversial fashion, Jordan Grace gets her rematch right here, right now. Grace rolls up Cardona for an early two count. Just moments into the match, Grace puts her strength on display as she lifts Cardona with ease for a vertical suplex. Cardona uses the referee as a shield, giving him an opening to gain control. Cardona hits a suplex into the corner turnbuckle. Grace comes back with a huge spine buster for two. Cardona hits two reboots, but it's not enough to keep Grace down. Cardona is about to use a steel chair, but Grace delivers a low blow, awarding the victory to Cardona by disqualification. So Matt Cardona keeps the title uh, by disqualification. And after the bell, Grace assaults Cardona with the chair, forcing him to retreat. What did you think about this? Clearly, they're extending the program between Jordan Grace and Matt Cardona. Uh, what do you, did you like this? Did you not like this? Do you want to see more of this? How you feel? Well, which they do need to extend it because other than that, there's nothing exciting for him to do with that belt. Right now, their feud is what works for that title. So, you know, he can't go back to wrestling John Schuyler next week, you know, to defend, um, you know, on BTI. So, uh, I didn't really care for the match too much. Um, I... I People don't like intergender wrestling. It doesn't bother me. If they want to do it, I don't see why we have to judge it. But it's not like Alicia Edwards is going out there and wrestling him. You know what I mean? Like, you're, we're seeing girls who realistically can are strong and can wrestle, you yes. know? Okay. We've seen you know, Tessa Blanchard, Ty Valkyrie. That's what we see as competitive, uh, competing over the years, mm-hmm. not you know, not the, the smaller girls or whatever. So um, I thought what this did, though, was it just further cemented the heel role for Cardona, but it... it um, it further cemented the baby face uh, role for, for Jordan Grace. Like I thought, yeah. I thought she looked stronger as a baby face in this match. Um, and she's just little by little to becoming a bigger star. So um, it, it was cool for that. And then uh, I guess off camera, Scott Demore came out and said, you know, are you guys, I wish I could do his voice, man. Uh, actually, I'm glad I can't. But... Just, just dig down and let it rip. Just let it rip. Yeah, why, did you, why did you stay so much? Like, Josh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he said, he told the people there, you know, you guys deserve a clean finish. So because you didn't, you all get free tickets to the show tomorrow. So, nice. you know, we talked about you know, being creative and stuff like that. Like I, I can dig it. Uh, you know, I can dig it. Um, and then he said, if you already bought a ticket, then you're going to um, uh, voucher for discounted merchandise at the show. So nice. good idea. I, I, I'm cool with that. Um, another thing they did, you also know, tells you a lot about how ticket sales are going for that second night. Yeah, it's very telling at the same time. But, yes. you know, they they came up with a creative way. Yes. Uh, some, and some people were saying I should have been happy with their alternative commentary, commentary team. Because, like, oh, we always want them to do something different and take chances. It was like Tracy Brooks, uh, you know, Lisa Marie or whatever the mm-hmm. hell her name is, Tara, and um, mm-hmm. SoCal Val. Right. And I guess you had to, if you ordered it on a fight, that was the team. Dude, I would have paid a hundred dollars in the past to not hear like Josh and Don or D'Lo and Striker. You know what I mean? Right. Like this is the time I care about. I, I was always saying have an alternative when, when those guys were on to give us a break. There's actually you know, a like, good commentary team now. Yeah, I don't, I don't want an alternative. But I guess what right. they were doing, it was more like a watch along. Um, and they they admitted that they had to catch up on the pro the product because you know at Slam of or Slam Anniversary, uh, hard to kill. Tom Hannafin, like you knew he had been watching the product. When they announced these three girls, I was like, they're not watching the show, man. Like, at least not to the extent that they can call it. Um, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure I was right on that one. So I think it was more like a watch along. Uh, yeah. But I, I almost checked it out, but I'm glad. And I it should have been presented as a watch along, not alternative commentary. Yeah. Because, and the, it, gra- because the people yeah. who care about commentary want better commentary. And so, yeah. like, and, and I didn't watch any of the watch along. I'm not commenting 
on whether it was good or bad or indifferent. I'm not commenting on that, but I'm just saying that if you, again, this goes back to the marketing, okay? If you're going to present something like that, you, you got you to gotta deliver what you're selling, okay? If you're selling alternative uh, commentary, like, and it's really like a watch along. I, I mean, listen, you could say it's the same thing. You could say it's the same thing. But again, you got to understand that people who want alternative commentary are looking for better commentary or somehow commentary that's more pertinent. Like people who are casual and not watching the product, they don't want alternative commentary. Okay. They're not like, oh, the commentary is not good. They don't watch the damn show. Okay. So what? Yeah. So, so for somebody who's so entrenched in the product that they want alternative commentary, you don't want to send them to three people who are catching up on the product. That's not smart. Yeah. That's not smart. So whatever. And the graphic they put out was such shit that I thought it was a joke. It was so bad. It was, it was not good. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was like so, some fan made this. You know what I mean? Like, I've always really hated Tracy Brooks, Brooks's wrestling gear. This is like the, the what is this? She just wears like a uh, like a bow tie and just like you know boobs out and just like I'm like come on man, there's got to be more to this like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like so like um like she was like a small person and then like her her breast grew like the incredible hawk and just bust out of her tuxedo <laughs> like, that's what it looks like um okay so uh gia miller was backstage interviewing tasha stills with her promo for the knockouts title when it was discovered that eddie edwards was laid out backstage and at this point, if you didn't already, you had to smell a rat, okay? Eddie Edwards laid out backstage, and so he would not be available for the team of also Rans that was Team Impact. Um, again, you had to know something was coming at this at this point, even if you had this barely been paying attention to, to what's going on so far. This was the worst-kept secret um, where, when it should have been, like, one of their biggest shockers in company history. Um but they really didn't do a good job of laying it out to where most of us saw what was coming. We didn't, it, you know, in the back of our head, we're like, they're not really going to do it. I thought they missed the boat on Eddie when he was, when he initially had the gimmick change and he was going at it with Tommy Dreamer. I thought they missed that boat at the time. Um, and they continued to keep him on the baby face path. So, you know, we'll talk about that in a bit, but yeah, worst kept secret ever. Yeah. All right, so we have the Impact World Tag Team Champions, the Good Brothers versus the Gorillas of Destiny, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa for the Impact World Tag Team Championships. Two generations of the Bullet Club explode in this historic first time ever matchup for the Impact World Tag Team titles. G.O.D. jumpstart the match as they charge at the Good Brothers to kick things off. The action spilled out to the outside of the floor with a wild brawl erupting. Uh, Gallows hit Tama Tonga with a powerful pump handle slam. Tama Tonga clotheslines Anderson, allowing him to tag in Tonga Loa. G.O.D. connects with a double team neck breaker, but Gallows breaks the pin up just in time. Anderson hit a percussion neck breaker on Tama Tonga for two. The Good Brothers deliver the double team offense on their own. Tama Tonga soars with a top rope splash to Anderson. Then Chris Bay comes down to ringside as Gallows choke slams Tonga Loa on the floor. Jay White sneaks up behind Tama Tonga and hits him with the Blade Runner. The Good Brothers capitalize with the Magic Killer to retain the Impact World Tag Team titles in a shocking turn of events. Now, um, uh, then after the match, Jay White and Chris Bay celebrate with the Good Brothers as it appears that a new Bullet Club has been formed. So let me say this. I really liked how when this segment started, um, when this match started, Tom Hannafin did a good job of pointing out because a lot of people, we can't be the only people who have been looking at the good brothers going, okay, where's the, where's, where's the stake? We're getting the sizzle. Where's the stake? Right. Or, or whatever. Um, so it was important to reinforce. And I've been complaining about this, about AEW, by the way, they've been trying to run back a lot of stories that people already know from ROH and new Japan, but you can't just assume that people watch that stuff. You know what I mean? You can't assume. And it really annoys me to be honest with you because when you have a promo between, um, you know, Adam Cole and, and Hangman Page in the ring and they spend the first five minutes referencing their past from New Japan, 
it's just very annoying to me because I didn't watch that. Tell me why I don't like you now. Tell me why we have a problem now. And then if you want to make reference to what happened before, that's fine. I'm not acting like you should pretend like it doesn't matter. But don't just expect me to go, ooh, when I see you two in right. the, face-to-face in the ring. This is my first time seeing you face-to-face in the ring. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, so don't assume that everybody's in on the inside joke. Don't assume that everybody watched the old stuff. Again, speak to your audience. Know who your audience is and what they have seen and what they haven't seen, okay? Um, I really liked how Tom Hannafin, at the beginning of this match, pointed out that the beef between Gorillas of Destiny and the Good Brothers basically stems from this idea that the Good Brothers left New Japan and never were properly excommunicated from the Bullet Club. And they've been going all around to their different stops and basically representing the Bullet Club without representing the Bullet Club. So they've been living off their Bullet Club fame without really being in the Bullet Club. And the current members of the Bullet Club have a problem with that. Boom. Yeah. There's your story. That makes sense. That makes sense. I don't need to have seen the old stuff. You just explained it, right? You just explained it. There's this thing. It's very popular. You know about it if you're a wrestling fan. Even if you don't, if you you haven't watched it all, you know it's a thing. And you know that it was a thing a while ago. And you know that it's still a thing now. And the people who are part of that thing now don't love the idea that people are still repping it and they haven't been a part of it. That makes total sense. So basically with that intro, what you told me is that um, the gorillas of destiny were here to make sure the good brothers got a proper beat down and send off from the bullet club. Um, And again, that set the stage for me perfectly for what was to come. Right. Because with my understanding being that, you know, again, this is their beef. They're here doing bullet club business. And then it ends with the swerve with them getting excommunicated from the bullet club and the good brothers basically getting, you know, brothered back in. Uh, I mean, to me, that was a huge swerve. I thought that was a huge, huge, huge swerve. And um, it makes me say where, where it makes me wonder where this is going next. It makes me think that this is going to be uh our next stage of the AEW Impact Wrestling working relationship slash working relationship slash forbidden door situation, and the thing that makes this part of it exciting to me is the chance that Chris Bay could be involved with it too. Yeah, um, I was you know if you don't watch AEW, there's a storyline where Adam Cole is they're teasing that he's going to have to choose between uh, the elite teaming up with the red dragon the red dragon with red dragon and possibly bullet club and i was thinking you know they have to bring more bullet club members on screen i don't think it's going to be i, I was just kind of like i can't imagine they're going to do gorillas of destiny uh the good brothers makes more sense for aw television and it does open the door that maybe chris bay appears there as well you know we'll see so it, it, this was all this is probably one of the better parts of this show are the Good Brothers getting interesting? I have to ask that question. Um, we're, we're trending there, you know. Um, so I, I'm excited about this. This was this came out of nowhere. It also tells me usually when they exile someone from the Bullet Club, there's usually a bigger picture for the people who got kicked out. Uh, so is is it possible that um, the Grills of Destiny uh, prefer to remain in the United States for a while? You know, that could mean they're going to end up on AEW. It could mean Impact has a chance of keeping them on board for a while, which would benefit them quite a bit. So I'm excited. This is this is one of the better parts of the show. Yeah. So, I and, uh, so for me, this was the moment of the night for me because this was a, the, a part that had, I thought, genuine imp- intrigue and a genuine surprise, at least for me, because, again, while I don't while I'm not up on the Bullet Club history, I like how Tom Hannafin set it up at the beginning. And then the way it ended was like, boom, nice surprise. I loved it. Big fan of the way that played out. So yeah. for, for me, this was this was my favorite moment of the night. And I'm intrigued as to what's to come from everybody involved here. All right. Mm-hmm. So next we had the Knockouts World Championship match. Mickey James versus Tasha Steeles with Savannah Evans. 
Mickey James put up the Knockouts World title on the line against the winner of the first ever Knockouts Ultimate X match, Tasha Steeles. Mickey hit a running boot to gain control in the early going. Uh, Tasha turns the tide with a springboard drop kick that sends her to the floor. Tasha calls out Mickey's husband through the camera, but that only fires Mickey up, who hits her with a neck breaker. Tasha distracts the referee, allowing Evans to get involved and throw Mickey into the steel ring post. Tasha hits a bicycle kick for two. The momentum shifts as Mickey bites Tasha and hits a top rope Fez press for two. Chelsea Green evens the odds for Mickey as she takes out Evans on the apron. Mickey sends Tasha crashing into Green, then scores the pinfall to retain the Knockouts World title. Um, so I, I think we all kind of know where this is going. Um, I got to say, though, just, just to beat a dead horse, okay, I thought you could have built up a little more excitement for this match. Tasha Stills has a fan base. Tasha Stills has a fan base. Like, there's people who really – ride for Tasha Stills and are checking for everything she's doing online. I thought, you know, we talk about the marketing, right? And how there's different like marketing campaigns. I would have done a whole marketing campaign talking about Tasha Stills journey, winning the ultimate X match and just really selling how big of a moment this is for her. And yes, you'd have the disappointment of her losing, but again, you still would have people talking about this show and this match who otherwise would not be like Tasha mm -hmm. Stills. I thought, you know, from the from the knockouts knockdown to the ultimate X to this match, she's had a really good few months, man. And she deserves to get that shine. And even if you're not gonna put the world title put the knockouts title on her anytime soon, which is fine, you still have built her up. So keep that going. It makes sense to me. So anyway, that is what it is. But 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 we do know where the rest of this is going. You know, um, I'm sure Chelsea, we assume Chelsea Green is going to uh uh, ask Mickey James for a knockouts title match to uh, as a thank you for helping her, you know, fight off Savannah Evans in this match, at which point we will get the long anticipated Chelsea Green heel turn and we will get the detestable couple of, uh, of, of, uh, who's this guy? Zach, uh, Matt Cardona. Yes. Matt Cardona. <laughs> and, and another interesting wrinkle to this, I believe Chelsea is the number one contender for the, uh, NWA women's title. Ooh. Uh, well, she won, the, she won the cup. She won the tournament. But when I went to the TV taping, it's hard because you don't have commentary. I thought she potentially lost it in a match. And I don't remember seeing that match on TV. Uh, I felt like she put it on the line and lost it. But um, she hasn't been on the last couple episodes. So I don't I, I, I don't know. Um, but, that, but I still can see a world where she does come and, and take that title off Camille. And that would make them even more interesting, um, okay. you know. So, but yeah, uh, at least I think they're doing a pretty good job in making Tasha. They're building her up even in losses. You know, I don't think she came off weak, but they they definitely should have, uh, you know, marketed her accomplishments a lot more than her than Savannah Evans carrying an X around. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think they just did a poor job in general with the women's ultimate X and how they could have communicated that to the wrestling world of what a big deal that was. You know, again, they were just trying to pop the impact audience and it has to be, you, you got to take it the next step to do that. They're talking about Facebook ads. You know, I kept talking about, you know, a video package of you show your library that you love so much to AJ Styles and all these dudes jumping on and, and then have something you say, hey, now the women are going to do this. You know, like that didn't circulate social media the way it needed to. So um Mickey James fine as shit, man. She came out and every time I say every time she comes out, I'm like, wow, bro. Um, but yeah, th th this was cool. I knew Sasha. I knew Sasha. I knew Tasha wasn't gonna win, but you know, that's cool. Right, right, right. Definitely. Um, all right. So, Rich Swan in the back reveals that Doctor Ross has not medically cleared Eddie Edwards to compete tonight following his attack at the hands of an unknown assailant. Swan introduces his longtime friend and tag team partner as Edwards' replacement, Willie Mack. All right, here we go. <laughs> I, I, was I was listening to, yeah. um, uh, what the hell is his name? Vince Russo the other day. And he was mm -hmm. saying, the wrestling fan right now is so much smarter. Like, you can't, when, when you do stuff like, you know, Dr. Ross, like, we all know he's not a doctor, you know? It's kind of the, it's it's the reason why on screen we see a lot of married couples linked up or they acknowledge that they're married or acknowledge they're in a relationship because we're smarter than that and 
you know, he was talking about you can't be making up stuff that people know is phony. Uh, years ago, yeah, you could absolutely got away with that. But, you know, like, we're, we're smarter than that, dude. Like, come on now. So uh, that's all I wanted to say on that. Yeah. So up next, we had the Impact World Championship, Moose versus W. Morrissey. Uh, w. Morrissey challenging Moose one-on-one for the Impact World title, finally after chasing for a long time. Uh, is a clash of titans. Brian Myers, who's had his issues with Morrissey in recent weeks, joins Tom Hannafin and Matthew Raywald on commentary. I was curious as to why Brian Myers was there. He didn't play into the match at all. That was, but he was okay on commentary, I thought. I thought uh, he was perfect. The, the yeah. snarky comments that he just threw in there. Was, I like how he know. kept calling uh, he kept calling Morrissey Giant Gonzalez. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's, you know, that's when, when he mentioned, oh, wow, I can't believe Penzer got through that without uh, messing up, yeah. you know, and then at the end when he loses, all, you know, dead serious, he's like, well, maybe he can appear on an episode of BTI or something. Oh my Talking God. about Morrissey, you know, so. Uh, exactly. all, right. all right, so Moose hits one, but not two spears in the first few minutes of the match. Morrissey avoids the third spear and connects with a big boot. Morrissey hits a thunderous BQE powerbomb, but Moose rolls to the outside. Morrissey Irish whips him into the steel guardrail. Moose sends Morrissey crashing through the timekeeper's table with a vicious urinagi. It's not enough to keep him down as Morrissey comes back with another BQE, this time on the apron. Moose counters with another BQE attempt into a Hurricane Rana. Moose connects with yet another spear, but Morrissey gets under him, gets him, uh, gets his foot, gets his arm under the bottom rope. Morrissey hits another BQE, and this time it's Moose who puts his foot under the bottom rope to break the pin. A few moments later, Moose hits one final spear to retain the Impact World Title. Um, so listen, <sighs> this match was overbooked like crazy, man. Like, yeah, they, um, they, they've been doing that for their main event. Like, like. Moose, you know, Moose and Morrissey can do a lot, but like, but I, listen, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they need to find a way to maybe get some ring time together before the matches start, but just trying to do too much is making the matches come off like choppy. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, let's get to this spot. Oh, let's get to this spot. And then they both do the foot under the rope spot. It's just like, it's just, right, it's just right. too much. It's just too much. Like, just you just got to find a, a better way to make the match flow. It seemed to be a lot of quote unquote, let me get my stuff in. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and, and I don't know, like just the, the match got to flow better. Uh, Moose is on an unfortunate streak. He's on the Brian cage. I'm the world champion, but I'm not the main event streak. This is two pay-per-views in a row in which Moose has been the world champion, but not been the main event of the show. Um, if you're Moose, you need to change that, man. You got to be the biggest attraction. You got to find ways to get your hatred up, uh, get your likes up, whatever it is. Um, and you got to make sure these matches come off more smoothly. You know what I mean? Like, I, again, I'm not the wrestling police. I'm not the wrestling police. But when I see two giant dudes just trying to do too many flippy dippy flyy type moves and they're not hitting, then it just makes me say you're doing too much, right? Again, that's not me being the wrestling police. That's you guys taking me out of the match by missing on some of this unnecessary stuff you're trying to pull off, you know? So like you guys are, you know, big and strong and powerful. Like, yo, man, you know, you guys put together a, a good match, but there was just a little bit too much, you know, there was too many efforts of high spots. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I don't know. And this is very similar to the um, the triple threat match. I mean, very overbooked. Uh, you know, the rope spot, it's very similar to when, you know, one wrestler kicks out of a finisher. So then they got, you know, in turn, they got to kick out of the opponent's finisher. And, you know, this, I didn't really care for this, dude. I, I'll yeah. get into it. All right, so we had Team Impact, Rich Swan, Willie Mack, Chris Saban, Rhino, and Steve Macklin versus Honor No More, Mike Bennett, Matt Taven, Kenny King, Vincent, and PCO. If Team Impact wins, Honor No More must leave Impact Wrestling. So Team Impact battled Honor No More, and let's see. There was a lot going on in this show, okay, guys? Like, I don't really have to read all stuff. It was like, it was, it was a lot. There was, there was a ton of spots. There was one part where there was like, I think four dives over the top rope in a row. And it was cool. It was cool to see at the moment, but it was one of those moments that made me say, this is why, like, um, 
you know, you got to find ways to, to regulate what's done in each show. Because if you just did this in the X division match where there was like three guys diving over the top rope at the same time, like, why do I care that there's four dives back to back to back in the show? You know what I mean? Yeah, like you're desensitizing me to the stuff. So anyway, um, but there was, there, <laughs> yo, PCO is crazy dog. Like the stuff that this dude can do, like for his age and his size, like, yeah, it, that, that that's, that's definitely like uh, crazy to watch. And I'm pretty sure that, that dude, Vincent dyed his hair. Those gray dreads were freaking me out. And I was like, man, um, how old is this guy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have my question. <laughs> and it looks like he came back with brown hair tonight, which I don't have a problem with. So, yeah. Um, so, but this match ended with, let's see, Taven hit a blue thunder bomb on Swan, but his partner, Willie Mack, breaks the pin, breaks up the pin. Uh, Swan sidestepped a charging PCO, causing him to crash and burn on the outside floor. Rich Swan and Willie Mack joined forces for a top rope swinging net breaker on Bennett. PCO hit a huge choke slam on Macklin, followed by a leg drop from the top rope. Kenny King sent Macklin into the referee. King, Saban, Taven, and Swan take to the skies with draw dropping back to back to back. Uh, aerial dives over the ropes. PCO did a D animator on Rich Swan and Willie Mack, followed by a red rum from Vincent, which is basically the same thing. Uh, PCO <laughs> flies once again, hitting the PCO salt to the outside. Eddie Edwards hits the ring, but in the ultimate betrayal, turns his back on Team Impact, just kindo sticking everybody in sight over the head. Uh, then Kenny King crawls into the wing, into the ring, and gets the pin for three, allowing Honor No More to steal the victory. So Eddie Edwards stands alongside Honor No More. As the reality begins to sink in, that honor no more will now be allowed to remain in Impact Wrestling. Uh, Bash at the Beach '97. This was not, but uh, um, but uh, but it had that feel, right? Like in, in terms of the storyline, you know, uh, you know that was the famous moment where the NWO was formed, where Hulk Hogan came out and uh, joined Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. But um, I mean. I guess this was a big deal. You know, I guess it was a big deal. I'm I'm very interested to see what Eddie Edwards can do as a heel. You know, Eddie has done so much. And I'm interested to see, you know, where he goes uh, with this. Um, one thing that I could not ignore on this show was the production issues. And there was another one at the end of this show. Um, the show goes off the air and then pops back on with getting a shot of Eddie Edwards' team impact badge laying on the floor. And then they come back and they're shooting the ring. And then they just go off without the impact um, back end again. And it's just, you know, those type of things, man. It's just those type of things. So anyway, yeah, was, what'd you, what'd you think of this main event? What'd you think of this show as a whole? Yeah, there were some issues, audio and visual uh, video, you know, I think one match, the lights didn't come on or something. So, you, you know, the match, the match was okay. Uh, I already knew what was going to happen. I didn't watch live but i you know I, I knew so i was just kind of anticipating the end so i can't say i was super invested on what they were they were doing this is where i thought and, and again this was i think not well done when, when it came to this is one of the most interesting story like that's not what i'm saying but i think we all saw this turn coming and it would have been so much more impactful if we didn't um but there the they were laying the seeds for it and not every heel turn has to be teased. You know, like this was one, you know, like, as you say, it wasn't bad to the beach, but this really had a, a potential to be really big and to really shock us. And it, it wasn't shocking, but where I think it truly missed the mark, I understand why they pinned Rhino at the end because they were, they needed to tease the, the spear spot and all that, the gore. I, I feel like they are doing a babyface turn with Steve Macklin, and it would have gotten over more if he was the one who got screwed. Uh, you know, years ago when Stone Cold turned on the WWE team and he stunned Kurt Angle, that elevated Angle to a new level. He was already at a high level, but that that elevated him even further and into a big time program. And if you're if they if that in in Back, they're like, hey, we want Macklin. We think he can have a badass type of babyface dude run. Um, then, then I I would have had him pinned there. And even if Josh Alexander was supposed to be in that spot, 
same thing. Like Josh Alexander should have been the one screwed. You know what I mean? So I, I don't understand the point of pinning Rhino other than, hey, we were teasing the gore and, you know, this and this. I get that. But it, it would have just been more impactful if the person they pinned got elevated in this. You know what I mean? If, if you have one of your top guys that's laying on his back, not the bottom guy in the match, um, you know, so. But yeah. hell of a cliffhanger. I am dying to see what they do. I want to see what he does as a heel. I don't think he has the chops to be a heel. Um, that's my concern. So we'll see. But, you know, a lot of people's promo styles improve greatly when they become heels. So we'll see. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be believable or not. Thank God they have some guys that can talk in that group. But if he's going to be the leader of it, then he's going to have to talk. Uh, is Alicia going to be part of this and she's going to be a heel now? Or, you know, they only factor in when, she, when, when they need her to be Eddie's wife. Um, and th- this is, you know, it seems like the kind of storyline they would throw her into. So, you know, you know, you know it actually seems funny. I can see uh, Alicia fitting right in here. Um, and like maybe she could be like Maria's sidekick. And you know how the I thing know, that yeah. Maria does that I love, and th- this act for years has never gotten old to me. I love it. It's it, it adds to every match. Maria interferes, 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 and it looks like there's a spot in the match where she's just going to get destroyed, and then, you know, somebody comes in and saves her. Um, And what it does is it ultimately builds to the spot where she ends up getting destroyed at some point, and it's like this huge payoff. But what you could do with Alicia is you put Alicia in and let her take the hits that Maria is earning, you know what I mean? So those spots where Maria would be getting speared, but somebody comes in and save her, you have Alicia step in and take the spear. (laughs) Right, right. I yo, I can totally see her working with this group, man. I I, I I'm here for it. Why not? Yeah. So it's just, it's it's exciting. I just think you know they probably could have done it a little bit better. Like we all knew when he tripped one of the non or no more guys in the match, and that was so far from anything he ever does. Do you mm-hmm. remember what I'm talking about? And they kicked him out of the match. Uh. It was like PCO ran off the uh, ropes and Eddie reached out and tripped them. Oh, okay, 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 okay. And it was like, that was so far from anything he ever does. And then mm. when he had the kendo stick and he was going to hit, uh, I think if, I think it might have been uh, the old guy and not PCO. Yep. Um, and then he like clearly held back. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was executed well. Mm-hmm. And it really telegraphed what was going to happen. Hmm, you know, interesting. they had a way of like he was going to hit him and they could have pulled him out of the ring and we would have right. never known. But they did that. They clearly showed that he hesitated and didn't want to hit him because they took too long to get, I think, it was Vincent out of the ring. And it just, um, I don't know. There was, there was a couple of things that, that just kind of let us know ahead of time. And yeah, you know, so I heard a lot of people hinting to this and I got a lot. I got to tell you, I missed all the I missed all the hints. I mean, but it was just one of those things where. Um, because it's Eddie Edwards and he's been there forever and he could use something to do, I, I'm open to the idea of him, you know, pulling a switch up. And this would be an interesting way to see him that we have not seen him before. So I'm totally here for Eddie Edwards as a heel. And it, it sets up a good Sammy Callahan return as the, as the baby face in this. Uh, now they have to have a dude. They got to have a, a, a guy, a, a dude, a main event baby face dude that can step up to these guys now. That's yeah. what they're lacking. He's the only option. So great point. That's a great point. Um, yeah. So that said, let's spin it forward here a little bit. Like, what do you think is going to be the fallout from no surrender? Like uh, the biggest question I have is what's next for Moose and what's next for the world title? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I don't know who he could possibly, because he got a clean win at the end of the day. So I don't know what they could possibly do. I think Jonah and Morris here are going to have an angle here. That's where I think, uh, I think that's what we're going to get. But Moose, as far as the good, uh, that's a problem you have when you're not prepping people for the main event scene. You know, I, I don't know who he could possibly go up against. I, I don't have a clue. Right. And I think that like, um, you know, this is one of those times when they're going to have to do some sort of like a quick heat up. Like, um, you know, for anybody who watches WWE, uh, they recently did that with Becky Lynch. I'm sorry, not Becky Lynch, with uh, Liv Morgan. And people were like really thinking that Liv Morgan was about to be. 
<laughs> they were thinking Liv Morgan was about to beat Becky Lynch for the for the championship. I was like, dog, y'all need to stop it. Becky just needs something to do to get to WrestleMania. And so, you know, they're heating Liv up for a match or two. And, you know, there's people out here mad that Liv Morgan is not, like, guaranteed the WrestleMania match. And, I mean, but that's just what you do, right? Like, when you're trying to get somewhere with your world champion, um, you got to you gotta, you, you gotta heat up some people who wouldn't otherwise have been heated up. And that's where you see what type of, um, you know, what, what type of cachet your world champion has with the fans, by the way. Because how much the fans get behind a baby face who's trying to challenge the champion really just says more about how much they want to see that champion lose, you know? So, yeah. um, so, you know, look, man, you know, this is what being a world champion is all about. It's about elevating other people. And, and, uh, you know, the, the Ric Flair's of the world, right? Ric Flair made Sting. Ric Flair made Lex Luger. Like Ric Flair made all these people because he would go there and people would get popular just so they could challenge him. And even if they didn't win, yeah. people were still like, oh, I know this guy's a big deal now because I saw him really push Ric Flair to the limit. So yeah. I'm very the interested, pop- very curious as to what, what they're going to do next with Moose. Yeah, because the problem is this is a really heel-heavy show. The heel won every single match. Um, for the guys. The only ones they didn't were Jake something and Trey Miguel, but they're in their own angle for the X Division Championship. Other than that, no, nobody won. So no one's hot on the babyface side. Exactly. Um, do I think Josh Alexander is coming back? Yeah. Do I think it's a work? No. We're going to talk about that later. Um, and he's he's the he's the dude. He's perfect to re- you know um, to wrestle, but. Uh, they got to have something for him to do now. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, he's definitely not going to be at this set of taping, Josh Alexander. So they got Moose has to do something. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe Charlie Haas. <laughs> kidding. Charlie Haas or a big cone, whatever they name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, man. So I think I think that's actually pretty good, man. We actually ended up putting in. Uh, ooh, was it like two hours? Something like we 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 got a. Well, uh, uh, this is a, this is a good a good packed show. Lots of stuff to talk about. Lots of stuff for you guys to react to. Make sure you drop your comments down in uh, down below. And um, yeah, BQ, anything you want to say to the people before we go? Tell the people where they can find you out here on these social media islands and in these social media streets. <laughs> Just at BQ Speaks on Twitter, and uh, you know, check out the next show. Yep. And don't forget also the Impact uh, Lounge engagement group on Facebook. That's where you drop your comments for the mailbag show, which we will be taping coming up here. And uh, you can catch me at TW talking about on your social media of choice. Also, please follow my podcast page and YouTube page uh, talking about pod. You can follow that on Twitter at talking about pod and you can search on YouTube talking about pod and um, you can find some of the episodes there. There'll be a new episode coming up later this week. Uh, all right, man. So again, thank you guys so much for, uh, for chatting with us for a few minutes. We hope you guys enjoyed this show. Um, the best thing you can always do to help out the channel is tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation real quick before you go, make sure you like comment, rate, and subscribe for BQ. I'm TW. Peace.